In the vibrant and tumultuous landscape of Nigerian journalism, few figures stand out as boldly as David Inyene Hundeyin. Known for his fearless investigative reporting, David has carved a niche for himself as a journalist, unafraid to challenge the powerful. His journey has been marked by both accolades and adversity. David's life took a dramatic turn in 2020 when he found himself in grave danger due to his involvement in the Enzars protests. Fearing for his safety, David made the difficult decision to flee Nigeria. In early 2021, he sought asylum in Ghana, where he hoped to find refuge from what he described as political persecution. In May 2022, David was granted refugee status in Ghana after a lengthy process. The Ghanaian government recognized the legitimacy of his claims and issued him a refugee travel document. This new chapter in his life allowed him to continue his work without the looming threat of arrest or violence hanging over him. All that would change the following year when the military junta overthrew the Nigerian government in July 2023. David's life took yet another turn after he leaked a sensitive document that allegedly detailed orders from Tinubu for Nigerian commandos to intervene in Niger. He was designated an enemy of the state by the Nigerian military and intelligence agencies. The Nigerian government quickly responded and tried to lean on the Ghanaian government to have him brought back to Nigeria for prosecution despite his refugee status. David responded with a video in which he passionately appealed to the Ghanaian government not to give in to the demands of the Nigerian government. He also exposed a failed attempt to have him illegally rendered by the Nigerian intelligence agency. I was informed that a, um, a Nigerian intelligence agency, I'm not sure whether it was the National Intelligence Agency or the Defense Intelligence Agency, but one of these um, foreign intelligence um, uh, institutions dispatched a jet to Accra to um, basically have me illegally rendered to Nigeria. Uh, apparently they sent, they wrote a letter to the Ghanaian government accusing me of um, apparently aiding terrorism. In November 2022, he published a documentary on Bola Ahmed Tinubu's drug case. His life, which had been upturned since 2020, took another course. His investigations raised uncomfortable questions about Tinubu's academic credentials and alleged past involvement in narcotics. As his articles gained traction, David became a person of interest in Nigeria, facing increasing scrutiny and threats from the government. An accountant living in the Chicago area who worked for Mobile Oil Nigeria with a declared monthly income of $2,400 had just deposited over $1.4 million in the bank. Drug dealers need accountants too. The main character of this story is an individual whose entire existence is as puzzlingly mysterious as it is loud in public. Following the fire at Dangote Refinery, David once again found himself amid controversy after he revealed an offer from a climate change group to have him write a damning story to discredit the existence of the refinery. David's rejection of the offer surprised people who believed his criticisms of Dangote in the past would make him jump at the chance to throw him under the bus. As usual, he took to his Twitter handle to explain his position. First of all, my criticism of Dangote Refinery has always been about the timing of its delivery and the politics that made them commission it in May 2023 nearly two years before it was due to be fully operational. That was, and remains, an entirely valid criticism. Every other criticism I offered revolved around concerns of monopoly business practices and potentially turning Nigeria's energy market into a monopoly, which is also a very valid concern. Ideally, one entity should not control the energy market for 200 million people. However, where the choice presented is between a potential domestic energy monopoly and the imposition of eternal energy poverty and import dependence by foreign actors. Which side do you think I'm going to pick? You think I'm going to campaign for the continued poverty of my continent for the benefit of some rich white guy simply because I don't like Dangote? Oh, this was a story where I was essentially just supposed to color in the blanks, fill in the gaps and put my name on it. and. Um, it also became very clear that this story was intended to use the language of um, environmental activism and concern about 
climate change and Nigeria's energy transition commitments and all those related things. David's passion for a working country spreads across Africa. He shares his thoughts on the socio-economic and political issues affecting Africans in Africa through his Twitter page. Following the suspension of Kenyan-based African Streams Media on YouTube and across all meta apps, David warns of the danger of divergent news censorship by people he describes as the Libito Corridor people. He says, Unfortunately, the Libito Corridor people are not capable of changing their worldview or adopting new tactics because here we are in big 2024 and Blinken is here accusing me and the guys in Nairobi of being Russian government cutouts. This tells me two very important things. One, the work that African Stream and others in the non-Western controlled African media space are doing is having a real effect in cutting through decades of foreign propaganda and raising the independent consciousness of the new generation of internet savvy young Africans. The US state propaganda machine cannot keep up with social media. So it is lashing out with petulant stunts like holding a press conference falsely accusing an independent media platform in Nairobi of being run by RT with zero attempt at providing any evidence for such a claim. Two, Washington DC's Libito Corridor government is planning to go to war in Africa. The first act in war is controlling the narrative. This is an attempt to destroy sources of alternative viewpoints so that Africans can once again go back to having only America woo woo as our news. When the information war is won, then the shooting war will commence. Dear African, you are under direct attack. Raised in an upper-class Jehovah's Witness home, David described how going on evangelism to parts of Lagos that were opposite, different from the plush neighborhood he was raised in, forced him to see the reality of the majority of Nigerians. He would later break away from the faith, which he calls a cult, when he got married in 2015 to a woman whom his family did not approve of. The marriage ended a few years later. In a post on his Twitter handle in July 2023, David tacitly said he had found love again. David has two published books to his name. The first, The Jungle, a personal journey with the enfant terrible of Nigerian journalism, whose launch came laden with controversies and was finally released in 2023 to critical acclaim. The book was ranked among Nigeria's best-selling non-fiction titles in 2023. In his sophomore book, Breaking Point, A Journalist's Quest for Salvation, in Nigeria's Chaos, released in January 2024, David writes about the challenges he has faced, reflecting on his private struggles. He talks about the emotional toll of his investigative work and the pursuit of truth, all while seeking moments of joy and fulfillment amidst chaos. His work has not gone unnoticed. David has received several prestigious awards, including the People Journalism Prize for Africa in 2020 and the GRC and Anti-Financial Crime Reporter of the Year in 2021. He was also the 2023 James Curry Fellow at Cambridge University. However, no prize has equaled that which he has had to pay for the work he does, where he lives a life of constantly looking over his shoulder and no place to call home as he reflects in a post on his Twitter handle. Personally, have done my part and I have paid a terrible price for it. Just how terrible you really have no idea. The last time I had a fixed address, I was 28. I'm 33 years old now. I have never tried to be a hero. Everything I ever did was because I genuinely believed in walking my talk and acting my beliefs. That's why I've never asked for help or complained about my circumstances. Today, David Hundayen stands as both a troublemaker and a savior, a title that reflects the polarized views surrounding him. To some, he is an enemy of the state. To others, he is a champion of truth and justice, a champion who, unlike the people he fights for, has had no place to call home. Four years ago, on October 20th, 2020, my ongoing journey began with the Lecky massacre which happened just a couple of kilometers from my apartment. Within the next 17 days, I was forced to smuggle myself out of Nigeria, and I haven't been able to go back since. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Hope you can hear me. Yes. 
You know, when uh, enemy of the state is um, supposed to appear on a show and we didn't see him, we were worried about that he stayed and got, got, got hold of you. Uh, what happened? Uh, there was there was an unexpected complication over here and I lost access to my Wi-Fi for a couple of hours. And I've, I've literally just been scrambling all over the place, but here I am. So all right. hopefully no further disruption. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for making time for us and for joining us. Um, where do we start? Um, there's an election. Uh, election happened here and um, Trump uh, was uh, reelected. And you've been yeah. making comments about that. Um, you think it's a good thing for Africa? Can you? I think it, it potentially could be a good thing for Africa. In and of itself, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a good or a bad thing, but I think it represents an opportunity. And the opportunity here is specifically in the case of Nigeria, Kenya, and a few other African countries that are very highly captured by American interests in terms of the control that the State Department and the CIA have over their their, their presidency or their, their government apparatus. For those countries in particular, the next two to four years represents an opportunity to reclaim some of their sovereignty if they're interested in, in, in doing such a thing. And the reason is that the amount of coordination that it takes for the State Department and its partners across the security and intelligence and uh, diplomatic services in the US to effectively dominate a foreign country. Um, that coordination, we're probably not going to see it over the next four years because Donald Trump is the proverbial bull in a China shop. Um, these two actors, as Donald Trump on the one hand and the so called deep state on the other hand, have never liked each other. But now that's the animosity has been amped up by a factor of 10 or 20 because he has a grudge. Um, he believes that in addition to having um, sabotaged his presidency the last time around and having supposedly stolen an election in 2020, which he still believes was what happened, he also believes that they have tried to kill him twice because, as you know, there were two attempts on his life during the campaign period. We don't know who was, who was responsible, but he believes that it's the men in suits that did it. Um, we will never know, obviously. And um, they've also dragged him through criminal courts. His face has appeared on a police mugshot. Um, so they've given him every incentive in the world to want to go after them. And in addition to all of that, this is obviously his second term, so he has no re-election to look forward to. So from day one, Trump has no incentive to pump the brakes. So every grudge he has against the people from that, the so-called deep state, that's the diplomatic services, the, the intelligence services, the security establishment, the civil service, the state department, the justice department, that entire intelligence community is going to be in its crosshairs. He has already said so. So what that means for countries like Nigeria and, like, and others like his across Africa that have been captured over the past few years is that um, the sort of um, foreign domination that we have been experiencing, we have an opportunity to cast it off because the entity, the US government, which has been imposing that domination for the next four years is going to be far too occupied with its own internal fires. It's going to be way too busy fighting itself. Trump is going to be fighting everyone within Washington, D.C., whom he perceives as part of the so-called swamp. And it just so happens that the swamp is the same you know, group of people and institutions that are responsible for coordinating what is normally referred to as the empire. So basically countries around the world where the U.S. government has a significant amount of influence, both stated and unstated, as in the case of Nigeria. So what this means for us practically over the next 24 to 48 months is that, for example, um, if there were to be a situation where maybe there's an election or there is a some sort of nationwide revolutionary campaign, whatever it is, the person who is occupying uh, the, the incumbent can no longer count on the U.S. establishment for support and backing to remain in, the, in, in, in their position. And we have a sort of very recent example of how it works when the U.S. stands behind someone who is unpopular in their country. So, in Kenya, as you know, as recently as three or four months ago, 
Um, at a point, it looked as if William Ruto was certain to have to step down. At a point, he had to fire his entire cabinet. Um, his government looked to all intents and purposes like it was dead. There was no way, there was no realistic way forward for a William Ruto presidency. It looked like that. His country was quite literally burning in a way that it hadn't done maybe since the days of Daniel Arab Moy. And the U.S. ambassador made the, made the call that, you know, Ruto is our guy. You know, Ruto has carried out every instruction we have given to him. As you may be aware, the U.S. mission in Haiti, which is being, which, you know, uses Kenyan um, manpower as its front. So basically, it's a U.S. funding, essentially a neo-colonial um, occupation of Haiti using Kenyan police and Kenyan troops. And Kenya is getting paid for that. Right. So essentially, um, Kenyan fathers and you know uncles and brothers, you know, Kenyan men are being sent to die in Haiti for American interests. And the Kenyan government is getting paid for that. That's the sort of relationship that exists between William Ruto and the US government. And because of his very sort of loyal and unquestioning um acquiescence to everything that has been asked of him by the US government, they, they stood behind him and made it such that. Um, every diplomatic support that was needed for him to survive, bear in mind that the entire Kenyan government has basically changed since July. The entire cabinet has changed. Even the, the vice president is no longer there. The only person who has survived is William Ruto because he's a very loyal U.S. puppet, right? That's what the U.S. can do for you if you're a good enough puppet to them. They can keep you in charge of a country when your people don't want you there, right? They have the power to do that. So now that over the next 24 to 48 months, depending on how, how long it takes Trump to enact this, um, this uh, campaign of, of revenge that he has in store for the deep state, a lot of these characters, first of all, they're not going to be in the State Department anymore. A lot of them are going to resign or get fired. Some of them have already started resigning. And the ones who are left over are going to be way too busy trying to appease whoever it is that needs to be appeased in Washington, D.C., trying to survive and keep their jobs or just trying to put out fires back home to be able to effectively coordinate whatever it is that they're doing on the continent. So that means that within that time window, if the Kenyans then decide to do a Ruto must go part two, he isn't going to survive this time. And something similar could happen in Nigeria as well, maybe in the context of an election, I don't know. But the point is, um, everyone who has an interest in, um, in, in concepts like sovereignty and freedom, the next 48 months are very crucial in casting off whatever needs to be cast off because after that you know i fully expect that you know even if it's another republican um i think the only president in the u.s that offers this kind of opportunity is donald trump i don't think anyone else offers this opportunity so i think once donald trump leaves office the u.s establishment is going to regroup and it's going to return so whoever hasn't successfully purged their country of any malign influences by then well good luck to them you were part of uh, NSAS. Uh, did you see the hands of the Americans in stopping it for the government? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, in in the case of NSAS, it wasn't um, it wasn't a direct intervention like it was in Kenya. So in Kenya, they supplied um, equipment to the Kenyan police. So those water cannons and tanks they were using on protesters. So if you look closely, even the uniforms the Kenyan police were wearing, you would see American flags on them. So there's very direct um, intervention in the case of Kenya. In Nigeria, it was a bit more indirect. So what happened was, after the Leki massacre, for example, it was widely expected that based on, you know, um, expectations that one would have of the U.S. government, these are the people who fund all these NGOs and CSOs concerning the human rights and civil liberties, you know, expansion of the civic space, you know, all your MacArthur foundations and your OC, well, these are all U.S. establishment funded institutions that are constantly pushing these messages. So we expected that the U.S. government and its affiliate organizations in that space would at the very least issue some sort of very strongly worded condemnation of what happened. And instead, what happened was radio silence across board. So I remember when I just left, so the massacre happened on the 20th of October. I, I left Nigeria on the 6th of November, 2020. And between that November 6th and I think about March the next year, I 
reached out to everyone I knew because, as you know, I used to be quite chummy with the U.S. embassy in well, with the U.S. consulates in 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 Lagos, right? I used to attend all the. I was always getting invited to one event or the other. In fact, in 2018, they nominated me for the IVLP. I don't know if you're aware of that. So I was a friend of the house. So I reached out to everyone I knew, and not just in the U.S., also, you know, U.S. allies, Canada, you know, Germany, Netherlands, you know, everyone I knew in the diplomatic space in Abuja and in Lagos, that why is no one saying anything? That this guy has just murdered hundreds of innocent protesters on the street, civilian protesters, unarmed civilian protesters. This is, this is worse than a war crime. Right? How can there be no response whatsoever? And you know, I used a lot of energy reaching out to people, and you know, and eventually, the one time I got any kind of response, it wasn't even from an American. The Americans completely blanked me. The one time I got a response, it was from someone who works with the EU, who used to work with the EU delegation to Nigeria. And what he said, not in so many words, was the only concern that. Um, sort of NATO and sort of NATO affiliated, you know, governments have with Nigeria at that point in 2021, the only concern we have is stability. So in other words, anything that could potentially bring down the government of Buhari and could potentially lead to some sort of upheaval in Nigeria, we're not interested in that. So even if it, he implied this, he didn't say this, but he implied this, he implied that even if um, the only way to maintain that stability was to send weapons to Buhari to shoot more protesters, that they would do it. That was the implication of what he said. And that was where, for the first time, I had my sort of like my, my come to Jesus moment that these people that you think are your allies and your friends are interested in your civil liberties and your freedoms and your human rights, they're really not. The only thing that they are really interested in is their own interests. If their interests happen to align with yours, then sure, they'll be very happy to help you out. But if your interests do not align, you're not a person, you don't matter. So, and it was, you know, that was someone obviously from the EU delegation, but I could also extrapolate from that. that this was the reason why the US government kept completely silent, completely silent. There was no response whatsoever. Joe Biden came into office in January 2021, right? So, you could say, okay, the massacre happened under Trump. So, you know, maybe it was Trump's responsibility to, you know, his government should have said something. Maybe Mike Pompeo, who was then the U.S. Secretary of State, should have said something. He did say something, in fact, Mike Pompeo. He put out a, like a tweet or something. It, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like an official, he didn't officially put Nigeria's government on notice, but at least he said something, right? Joe Biden's government came in and from day one they made no secret of the fact that they were best of friends with Buhari. They had no problem with him whatsoever. One of the very first decisions, foreign policy decisions that Joe Biden's government took, if you recall, when Anthony Blinken became the U.S. Secretary of State, was that Nigeria had just been placed on the list of countries of particular concern for violation of, of religious freedom. This was a direct result of the work that some of us had put in when we put together the the um, the, the report titled uh, "Silence Slaughter: Genocide in Nigeria and Implications for the International Community." So it was um, the late Dr. Obadiah Balafia, Dr. Richard Ikebe, Dr. Aya Dedoi, myself, and a few other uh, people who worked on this report. We submitted it to the the U.S. State Department and the U.S. Vice President's Office, the then Vice President Mike Pence. You know, and we got the, the result of that was that Nigeria was placed on that list by by Mike Pompeo shortly before he left office. That was Mike Pompeo's last major uh, foreign policy decision as Secretary of State. And as soon as Anthony Blinken came in, literally a few months later, one of the first things Blinken did was take Nigeria off that list. So that was the clearest indication you could get that, in addition to not caring that this government has literally just murdered hundreds of innocent unarmed civilian protesters that they're actually happy with this government and they're actually facilitating and actively aiding and abetting what this government is doing. Because, you know, you've had your immediate past Secretary of State put Nigeria on a list stating that there, this country is a country where there is a heightened risk for practitioners of a certain religion. They're undergoing a genocide in a, in a part of the country, in the Middle Belt, because Christians were undergoing a genocide in the Middle Belt. This was proven. And Anthony Blinken comes in and says, 
there's no problem. We're taking them off the list. Nigeria is fine. There was no, for the rest of Buhari's tenure, there was no kind of friction whatsoever with the US government. We're best of friends, right? And that these people who have this influence, they only use that influence in their own interest. They are not, they don't really care whether 200 million Nigerians die or not. That's not really their business. It's not that they hate Nigerians. It's just that Nigerians are not a factor. Nigerians are not important in their own calculation. So yeah, that was that was sort of how I started to come to an understanding of sort of moving away from just journalism that is focused on just exposing corruption and looking at the bigger picture that Nigeria exists within a geopolitical context and Nigeria as it currently exists is not sovereign. Now, talking about that bigger picture, you were credited with um, stopping a war, probably a war between Nigeria and Niger, where you leaked official um, order from Tinubu that Nigeria should invade um, Niger to, to get out the coup plotters. What do you think? I know you do a lot of this uh, extrapolation of what will happen. How would you think um, that would have changed West Africa if that had gone on the war? Right. Okay, so first of all, I think I should, I should specify that the person who actually leaked the document is a soldier. The person who had actually who actually had access to that military signal is a soldier, and he, from what I understand, paid an even heavier price because he was traced, apparently. So even though obviously I paid a price for being the one who actually put it out there and published it, so I paid a hefty price for that. But I think we shouldn't forget the person who it was who actually leaked it, you know, and apparently was locked in a guardroom for more than a year, to my understanding. I don't actually know if he has regained his freedom now. So we should we should keep that question in mind. That person is the real hero in all of this. That's the person who actually stopped this war from happening. I was just a vessel. Now, um, if that war or if that invasion had gone ahead, um, there are many things that would have happened. The most immediate consequence that I can think of is that it would have put Nigeria in direct conflict with a Russian-backed military. And what that means is that this um, Niger, as you know, um, is it's not just supplied by the Russian military. It actually has a sort of de facto defense pact with the Russians. So if you attack Niger, you, it's not quite a defense pact that the Russians are then, you know, mandated to attack you in return. But, you know, in some way, shape or form, we are going to get a response from the Russian military. Why that would have been especially disastrous for Nigeria is that if you recall earlier in the year, I exposed um, the fact that Nigeria as it currently exists has no primary, um, has no uh, functioning primary uh, radar coverage in its airspace. There was a circular from the NCAA saying that an unidentified plane was seen flying over the presidential villa. It turned out to be a civilian aircraft, I believe the Max Air aircraft. But the point is, a country that um, cannot stop civilian planes from flying through unauthorized airspace, restricted airspace, that country was going to start a war with a country that was backed by the Russian Air Force that has all the MiG-29s and MiG-52s, fourth and fifth generation fighter aircraft that Nigeria does not have, that has all the missiles that Nigeria does not have. It would have been nothing short of disastrous for Nigeria even more so than Niger. Because the most Nigeria could have done to Niger, I mean, he, you know how they say that he he that is down needs fear no fall. Niger was already pretty much one of the, I think the bottom five poorest countries in the world. So whatever it is that you do to them, how much worse can it be than where they already are? Nigeria, on the other hand, has a lot more to lose. And I remember making this analysis on my Twitter handle last year that if I were in the Russian Air Force and I was looking, I was looking at this say Nigeria had actually staged that invasion and it was my job to plot a sort of counter, a response to that, I can point at maybe six or seven strategic locations for airstrikes that would have ended Nigeria as a going concern. Even as a civilian, I can think of those places and this is how you end Nigeria as a going concern. I can think of the first and second Niger bridge. Those are like the key economic uh, link points that link basically one half of the country to the other. You conduct an, air, an airstrike on both bridges and 
the Nigerian economy essentially grinds to a halt. Add to that um, the Tactical Air Command Base at Makodi, which is Nigeria's largest Air Force base. An airstrike on that, Nigeria's Air Force is effectively put out of commission. Um, an airstrike on Fair Mainland Bridge, and the economy of Lagos is effectively put out of commission. Add to that the, the Tinkan Island port. Nigeria's ability to import and export is effectively put out of commission. And then maybe add the um, the uh, Amory at Kachia, which is like the it's the largest um, uh, uh, ammunitions depot in Nigeria. So airstrike on that, the Nigerian military no longer has any capacity to mobilize large amounts of weaponry. And then maybe the two sort of bonus airstrikes on Mogadishu barracks in Abuja, Dudan barracks in Lagos, that's it. Nigeria has ceased to exist as a going concern. That's how weak Nigeria is. And Nigeria was somehow going to poke this bear for some unspecified reason. You know, so the number one, the, the most immediate result of that would have been that Nigeria would have um, devolved into some sort of catastrophic refugee situation. And that would have had real implications for the rest of the West African subregion because where you have one country that is like 200 and something million, surrounded by countries that are like 30, 15, 10, 40 million here and there. And then that country, that big 800 pound gorilla breaks up you know, very suddenly, very violently, very unexpectedly, those other countries are going to get overwhelmed and the whole region basically devolves into chaos, total chaos. Nobody benefits, nobody, right? It's it's very interesting. I also made this analysis last year that if you look at the map uh, between Alaska and the northernmost point in, in Russia, the gap, which is known as the Bering Strait, is only 55 miles wide. So the, the distance between the US and Russia is about 55 miles. They have never fought each other directly. They have never fought each other on their own soil. They would rather fight each other in other people's countries. So they'll fight each other in Ukraine, in North Korea, in Afghanistan, in, you know, in Cuba, everywhere else, in Angola, you know, but they will never fight each other directly. Which So basically, you should never offer yourself up to be a theater of proxy war between those two elephants, right? Because those two players are only concerned about their own interests, right? So the Russians helping Niger is not because the Russians love the AES states. It's not because they love the concept of, 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 of African sovereignty. It's not because they're trying to help the Nigerians. There's a specific foreign policy goal the Russians are, are pursuing. Same as the people, the Western people back in Nigeria and ECOWAS, who are trying to push someone into invading Niger. It's not because they have any love for African democracy or anything. Everybody's pushing their own agenda, their own interests. So you should never let yourself become the grass for two elephants to fight on. And that's what would have happened to West Africa. We would have become grass for two very well-armed and very well-motivated elephants to fight on. The, the proof of this is that even though that war didn't eventually happen, in some parts of Mali, if you recall, earlier this year, you had uh, uh, troops from Ukraine showing up saying that they are going to fight the so-called Wagner paramilitary forces in, who, are, who are present in Ukraine, effectively opening up another front in the Russia versus Ukraine war on African soil, right? That was the goal in all of this. It was to open up another front in the NATO versus Russia war on African soil, it really had nothing to do with the fact that Niger carried out a coup. Yes, that coup might have pissed off France, it might have kicked out French interests, it might have done this or that, it might have irritated France, yes. But that in itself wasn't important enough to start a war over. The real issue was that the powers that be wanted to start a war. And, you know, they had a look around the map, where is, where can we, start a war on the surface of this earth to test our latest weapons, fight each other as we want to, the, you know, Russia versus USA, and do so in a place where nobody's really going to pay any notice to it. Nobody's going to take pictures. It's not going to trend on Twitter. CNN is not going to report it. Nobody's going to care. Because it's just a bunch of Black people dying in darkest Africa. Nobody cares. And that's what was, that's what was going to happen to Niger and to Nigeria. You know, so... Um, nobody, nobody would have won. And even though the war didn't happen, even just the uh, just the the fact of those 
sanctions being imposed by Nigeria and then the counter responses, there was a lot of economic carnage that still came out of it. Although thankfully it wasn't as bad as it could have been.